was, how was this like the bouts you do in Japan each and every month? Easier. Why? Because he doesn't know how to do any submission. Let's go. Roughly hour long episode of Cage Nation TV. Welcome back. Sorry we missed you last week. Couple of personal issues, but we are back here, not amongst each other. No, no. Oh, you talk. Well, oh, barely. <laughs> not amongst each other, but uh, uh, just to let you know that we are back and we will do our best to keep these shows going week after week after week. Things happen. Sometimes we won't be able to do a show. We'll let you know when that is. Regardless of all of that that happened last week or did not happen last week, this week we make up for it with a huge exclusive interview. Albert, I will let you do the honors. I did it. After months and months and years and pretty close to two decades, I did it. He did it. I talked to people involved in MMA and I said, we should do this. And they didn't. And I said to other people, hey, we should do this. And they didn't. But today... He did it. I did it. They didn't. He did it. I did it. What did you do? I talked to the world's most dangerous man, Ken Shamrock, on the phone. Uh, we. Yeah, you, you were there too, but the UFC Pride and Pancreas veteran acknowledged I exist. You I believe that? spoke to him too. Were you there? Yeah. I did. Go get your sweat wag, your rag, you're sweating. Okay. You're, you're still... All right, so we will have that exclusive interview. We will have the interview in its entirety. We were thinking about putting it up in little segments and stuff like that, and then posting the interview in its entirety later. We can't do that. We were gonna get. We were just gonna give you a snippet. We're gonna give you the whole interview this week on Cage Nation TV, especially with the new the uh, news just coming breaking. Uh, about Ken Shamrock's fight that he was supposed to have. Well, um, it's, it's not included in the newsreel, so we might as well tell you now. Um, it was a couple weeks ago we talked about Ken Shamrock uh, signing on to fight in the Machine Freeman right. at the UCFC. Posters were made, bout agreements were signed. Um, today, among social media, we found out that fight fell through. And right now there are two different camps. There are Ian the Machine camp fans, people who think his side of the story is accurate. They're wrong. That's just my fandom talking. And then there are those of us who got the back of the world's most dangerous man because we know the legend is always looking to fight. Um, he, Ken's going to touch upon that in his interview. Coming and up, we also got what, the newsreel. We've got the newsreel. We've got the Cameron Perspective and uh, a whole bunch more. So stay tuned. The interview with Ken Shamrock is coming up later on in the program. Right now, we're going to send it to the Cage Nation TV newsreel. This is Cage Nation TV. It's time for another edition of Cage Nation TV newsreel, spanning the globe to bring you the latest news in MMA. Well, in the immortal words of the Poet Laureate, Mr. LL Cool J, don't call it a comeback. Dignan and Broombaugh MMA coaches have confirmed that the king of the Altoona amateurs, Lenny Carlheim, is on the fast track to recovery and is looking to come back better than ever. Carlheim injured his knee in one of the worst ways possible, tearing the tendons in his knee completely, requiring surgery and taking him out of active competition for the better part of a year. Carlheim's coaches have said that Lenny is healing better than expected and that the jiu-jitsu purple belt is drilling and sharpening his ground skills. Even better than that, Carl Heim has been working on his hand skills with one of the area's best strikers, trying to evolve his game even more. Lenny Carlheim was slated to fight Zach Schultz at CD MMA 8 for the vacant featherweight championship before he was injured. No return date has been set for Carlheim, but all roads are leading to gold. Well, at least for the next 37 months, Josh Rosenthal's career is up in smoke. One of the more recognizable referees in the sport, Josh Rosenthal, has been sentenced to 37 months in prison for his part in an illegal grow operation in a warehouse that he owned with an affiliate. Since his arrest, Rosenthal has not refereed and has likely seen the end of his officiating career. The marijuana seized from the Rosenthal-owned warehouse is estimated to be in the millions of dollars. 
Well, referees all over the world can breathe easier. Gilbert Ivel is retiring. Gilbert the Hurricane Ivel announced his retirement from the world of combat sports. The Dutch kickboxer has traveled from promotion to promotion, including stops at K1 Kickboxing, the Pride Fighting Championships, Affliction, and the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Ivel gained notoriety as being a loose cannon when he leveled a referee with a KO punch. Well, as we all know, hell hath no fury like that of a woman scorned, especially when she can beat you up. Hollywood Dirt Sheets are reporting that Henry Cavill, the star of the Warner Brothers blockbuster Man of Steel, has broken up with women's MMA legend Gina Crush Carano. Word has it that the Man of Steel has left the Queen of Thai boxing for another actress. The split has so far been amicable. Neither side has gone on record with any hurtful sentiments, but no pleas for privacy have been made either. And seriously, who in their right mind wants to be the follow-up act to a woman who breaks other women for money? This has been another edition of Cage Nation TV Newsreel, spanning the globe to bring you the latest in regional, national, international MMA news and information. Have you ever feared this happening or been annoyed when something like this has happened? One product can fix that. Secure Connect. Secure Connect keeps a retaining force against the plug, keeping it secured into the wall. You simply place each half of Secure Connect behind the plate, clip them around your cord, and push the yoke against the plug. That's it. You can use Secure Connect almost anywhere. Secure Connect provides the security you need with plugged in electrical devices, and Secure Connect has earned the good housekeeping seal of quality. Every home in America needs Secure Connect. Order yours today. Welcome back to this special edition of Cage Nation TV. This is going to run a little bit, around an hour. Obviously, I don't know how long it's going to run because, well, I mean, you can tell down here how long it's going to run. We don't know because we're taping this right now. It's not like it's, you know. But it's totally worth it. The world's most dangerous man acknowledged that we exist. Before we get to that interview, we do want to mention that Cage Nation TV will be covering some excellent fights within the next couple of weeks. Oh, yeah. Two in a row, as a matter of fact. July 19th, we'll be in Altoona for Valley Fight League, Broad Avenue Brawlers, uh, at, the jo at the Jaffa. I can't call it Jaffa because I'll get hit by Mike Kessling. It's the Jaffa <laughs> Uh, in Altoona, and then the next night in Pittsburgh for Gladiators of the Cage. Albert and I will be covering this event. We'll have all the results for you uh, June 19th in Altoona, June 20th in Pittsburgh. At, is that Stage AE? Yes. I have never been there. I've always wanted to be go there for concerts. Now I get to see MMA there. Stage AE is like the venue in Pittsburgh. Like it's the venue. The venue. And, and Gladiators of the Cage. And uh, Gladiators of the Cage on October... Or June, July 20th. Yes, you'll is, get it right. Is you're, going you're, to, I know, it's the whole Ken Shamrock thing. Just, huh, huh. Uh, Gladiators of the Cage on uh, July 20th is going to be televised for Root TV. Now, is that going to be live on Root TV or no. it'll be a tape delay? It'll be, it'll be tape delay. Okay. Um, so here's what you get to do you get to go out to Gladiators of the Cage. You get to see some awesome fights. They have a, I can't really say too much, but they have a Bellator fighter lined up. Um, Jessica Evil Eye. I, Jessica Evil Eye yeah. will be there. Um, I don't I don't believe she's fighting, but she will be there to talk to folks. Women's MMA is huge, and Pennsylvania is bringing it to you in a big way. Um, but then on July 19th, for Valley Fight League at the Jaffa Mosque, local favorites are going to be there. Um, I think there's talk about Ryan Glunt coming out of retirement to fight at Valley Fight League. Whoa, that's uh, big news. That is big. Um, of course, the madman Charlie Gathers. Charlie Gathers. The madman has signed on for Valley Fight League. Brett Showtime Schoenfeld. The Lionheart, Paul Riggleman. Um, Eli Garshnik's talking about being there. Like, you know, of, of guys we know, this, you know, this is the fight to be at. And then, of course, the next day, Pittsburgh's not that far away. It's less than three hours, I think. Now, for VFL, do you know if they're going to go for the standard format that I've gone through before? Are they going to do the boxing and the uh, jiu-jitsu and, and then go into the MMA? Or is I, it just going to be a strictly MMA show? I believe they're doing Thai boxing and MMA. I've not heard anything about traditional boxing. Okay. However, if you've never been to Valley Fight League to see how they set that up... That, I think that in and of itself is worth the price of the ticket, seeing how they set up from a ring, tear it down to a cage. I thought that was really, really impressive. It's really impressive setup. Uh, it takes a little bit, but it's worth the wait. Uh, VFL, uh, what is it, VFL 42 now? VFL 42, Broad Avenue Brawler 7. And, and you know, if uh, you got some folks like like my, my, my dad, he doesn't watch MMA, but he's familiar with boxing. Right. That is a great opportunity for me and the old man to come together and say, well, you like boxing, I like MMA, so now we get to meet in the middle, and that's Valley Fight League July 19th at the Jaffa Mosque. You can go to VFLMMA.com. But then, of course, the next day, Gladiators of the Cage, of course, they just signed Charlie Gathers to a three-fight deal. 
Jason the Whip Willet, and all those other huge fights. So, like, uh, we're going to bring you the countdown episode for those. We're going to bring you recap episodes. This is, July is really heating up for MMA, Drew. Will we film two special episodes, yes. or will it be all one episode rolled into two segments? The weekend of July 19th and July 20th, the Cage Nation is getting two special episodes. You're, two special episodes, one for the Valley Fight League, one for the Gladiators of the Cage. This is... We're that's a huge weekend. We're going to be working hard to bring you all that coverage. All right. Yeah. Enough of that. It is time now for the interview that this man has been waiting for for at least 20 years in the making. And uh, it's, it's a good one. Definitely very informative. You will not want to miss it. Do not touch your space bar. Here <laughs> it is. The world's most dangerous man, Ken Shamrock, on Cage Nation TV. The world's most dangerous man, Ken Shamrock, is as much of a pioneer and forefather to modern mixed martial arts as anyone can claim. 20 years ago, Ken Shamrock set foot into the octagon and within seconds of his first fight beginning, the crowd knew that this man was on a whole different level than the traditional martial artists they would see. Shamrock was a mixed martial artist before any of us knew what a mixed martial artist was. He knew how to wrestle with the wrestlers, strike with the strikers, and was one of two men who knew the submission game. Ken Shamrock became the first superstar of MMA. He was recognizable and vocal, and he could fight to back it up. The accomplishments and honors to his name are almost countless. The world's most dangerous man was the first king of Pancrase, the first UFC super fight champion, a main eventer in the first UFC fight on cable television, and a UFC Hall of Famer. As fans of mixed martial arts, we all owe a debt of gratitude to the world's most dangerous man, Ken Shamrock. Ken, how are you? Good. How you guys doing? Doing good. Oh, Ken. All right, Ken. Well, uh, I think the uh, one of the bigger things we uh, that came out in the news today was that the fight with Ian Freeman was pulled. Now, please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, from what I understand, the promoter was agreed to one amount. The promoter then came back to you and said, it's not going to be this amount. It's going to be less, but had already been using your likeness to promote that event. Can you uh, give us your take on that? Yeah, uh, we they'd actually contacted me um, about because when I was down there uh, with another organization doing some commentating down there, um, it it was Bama, and I made mention uh, because I guess Ian Freeman was looking for, uh, to come out and fight, and they asked me what I thought about it, and I said oh, it would be a great fight. I think uh, you know if uh, if that's the fight they do, I think it would be great. Uh, you know one legend against another legend and then all of a sudden it blew up i got this call all of a sudden they want to put the fight together and i said okay well you know whoever comes to me and, and wants to put the money up and get the fight done that's that's you know the person i'll fight for and so they came up with the money i had my attorney take over from there uh we negotiated a price that everybody agreed on i mean everybody was happy with it fact is they were my attorney was a little bit uncomfortable with the fact that they agreed to everything so quickly and uh so i said yeah but uh, that's because we weren't really trying to you know rip them off or take money so where they couldn't make money we, we made a fair thing there was no there was no tv no pay-per-view so we, we made a fair deal with them so they can make money and we can make a little bit of money but the, the, the most of all i wanted to get back in the ring and i thought you know, it would be a great fight for me to get back in the ring with so we agreed to it. We negotiated. Everybody was fine with it. And 30 days later, six weeks later, um, all of a sudden, the payment's supposed to be in, and there's no payment. And so my attorney tries to get a hold of them. They're not answering. Finally, uh, he threatens them with the act of, you know, if you guys are not getting back to us, we're assuming that you're not going to pay. Uh, so they got back, and, and they, they him on around, and, and it, it just felt to me like they were stalling. It just felt to me like they were stalling. They really weren't answering the questions. Then it got pushed, came to shove, and my attorney basically just told them, the, the, the deal here is you guys are in breach. June 1st, you were supposed to have money in escrow. Escrow was totally put into account because I couldn't touch the money, and they couldn't touch the money until after the fight, so that way everybody was protected. And... Um, and that's what we agreed upon. I thought that was fair for both parties, so I couldn't get all the money, neither could they, until after the fight, until after the performance was done. Well, still no money. And so, you know, we tried three times to get them to address the breach issue. 
And every single time they would skirt around that issue and ask basically that they, they weren't going to pay this amount of money. Um, I need to grow a pair of balls and I, I should just fight and stop pussyfooting around. You're a thief. You're a crook. You accept money and then you run. And just all these things that never had anything to do with the idea that they breached the contract. They tried to, they tested my, my emotions. They tested my, my mankind. Um, I mean, just everything but the idea that they breached the contract and they still have not put money where it needs to be. Ken, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they don't have athletic commissions like we have over here in the United States. Is that right? That's the reason why we did the escrow. Is because I felt like if I got to England and I depended on them to pay me, I was taking a huge risk because there's no laws down there that would govern them to pay me. So we did the escrow thing so that way they felt comfortable knowing that it's in an escrow account. It can't be touched until after the fight. That way I was protected and they were protected. We did that because there's no commission or anything to bind these contracts. Okay. Uh, that's that's one of the things that came out in the news today, Ken, and, and, I, and I appreciate you touching on that. Um, the rest of the interview is a little more, little more things that, uh, I really wanted to ask. I've been a huge fan of yours for, I think I'm coming up on decades, Ken. Um, you mentioned you want to get back in the ring. Now you fought in the UFC cage, but you've also fought in the pride ring. Do you have a preference as to fighting in a ring or a cage? Um, if, if I, if I had my choice, it would be in a cage. Um, just because I know there's no stalling in the fight. If you happen to end up into the rope. Uh, you got to stop because arms get trapped, heads get trapped, and in the fence, you get trapped. That's your own fault. Ken, uh, Bob Marowitz, one of the guys who was involved in the early UFCs, tried doing uh, what's called, he tried the Yama Pit fighting where the uh, they had the bowl-shaped surface. Now, if, if there's an expert in mixed martial arts, Ken, it's you. How did you feel about that bowl-shaped surface? You know, I, I, and, and Bob Iowitz, that's the, the background he comes from. Um, and I think with Mil, uh, Mil um, um, the one that actually uh, designed the cage when we first started the USC, that was really theatrical. It really stood out. Um, but I think that um, now we're all so accustomed to a ring or a cage. And to anything other than that, it's going to be very tough to sell to an audience now. Um, I know what Bob Meyer was trying to do. He's trying to change the game. He's trying to give it a new look. Um, but we're too far along with what MMA is today now and people are accustomed to that I think going too far out of the realm on something like that is it, you'd almost have to change what's inside the ring. Ken, uh, back in the day, if uh, Mike Tyson had agreed to go into, agreed to go into the octagon, would you have fought Mike Tyson, and how would that fight have gone? Yeah, you know, uh, I think it would have gone the same thing as James Tony and Randy Couture. Um, I, I think it was unfair um, for James Tony to have to fight Randy Couture. His first fight in the cage with no experience, I would have given him somebody like Chuck Liddell or or, or somebody that who was predominantly a striker, um, because. We are, we're not trying to prove one style is better than another style. We're not trying to piss other people off by saying we're the best. The idea is for everybody to enjoy fighting and different types of fighting. I thought UFC missed a huge opportunity with James Tony to not go in and just destroy this man with a strict grappler. By going in and allowing this man to at least have an opportunity to have some success, it's like throwing Randy Couture in there with James Tony in a strictly a boxing match. It would have ended the same way, very, very badly for Randy. Now, that being said, um, Mike Tyson. I think if Mike Tyson would have had some sort of training uh, to defend a takedown, Mike Tyson was built for this sport. Mike Tyson was the, was has the attitude and the determination and the anger to do a sport like this. I would have loved to have been able to see him get a little bit of training and get in the ring and do something like this, especially with his power, as quick as he was with his movements. Um, absolutely. But again, 
uh, he could have been very easily ruined, just like James Tony by throwing him in with a strictly a, I mean, a dominant grappler. I mean, he doesn't do anything else but shoot and take you down. Ken, in addition to being the uh, mixed martial arts legend that you are, you're also a very storied coach and teacher. If uh, Mike Tyson had shown up to the Lions Den, do you think Ken Shamrock, the coach and teacher, could have made him into what you think he, he had the potential to be? Um, depending on how far along he was in his career. If it was something he just, uh, like boxing, he's just starting out and he got a hunger for MMA, absolutely. I could have, he could have owned the world in MMA, I believe. Um, but um, if he was a little bit farther along and, and already had, uh, you know, passed the custom model, pre custom model and, and, and after custom model, if I had him pre custom model, uh, he would have been a, an animal, a destroyer. After custom model passed away, it would be tough to keep his attention uh, directed in one area. Ken, uh, when you came back to MMA after being involved in professional wrestling, um, before professional wrestling, you were considered a heavyweight, but that was before weight classes really existed. You come back into MMA, now we have the unified rules. What made you decide to go to light heavyweight as opposed to be, like fighting at like 220? Well, I, I, I think at that point in time, uh, you had Chuck Liddell, you had Randy Couture, you had Tito Ortiz. Um, the, the fights were at 205. There was really, at heavyweight, there was really nobody there me to really go in and actually fight. You had Kim Sylvia, you had Rico Rodriguez, uh, you know, it was, it was just that era where there wasn't really anybody all that impressive uh, where the money was being made was in that light heavyweight class. And that's the reason why I chose to do that class was because I thought the opportunity there, especially with Tito Ortiz being there with the feud that we had, that I could have really jacked up the numbers and gotten the UFC going to where it is today. And I was right, I did. Can uh, we know we know identify your style in the nineties as shoot fighting? Did you call it shoot fighting back then? Yes, I did. Uh, it was a term we used because over in Tank Race, it was feet fighting, uh, fist fighting, and ground technique put together. And we here in the states need to call it something we could understand. So it was basically shoot fighting because um, shooting was the wrestling term and grappling term, and fighting was actually the feet and the fist. Well, given your shoot fighting background coming from Japan, um, had you ever considered competing in like sambo tournaments or judo or are you into the grappling art considering that a lot of the guys who knew traditional jiu-jitsu didn't know how to handle your style? Uh, I No. Um, and the reason being is because uh, I started out in the purest uh, MMA. Um, my style was developed. Ken Shamrock, Lions and style was developed from the early days of MMA to the to, to, to today. So it is the purest MMA style. It's I I don't know how I mean obviously I know I'm a great rapper and you know if you look at my record I don't think I've been submitted but one time uh, in the UFC and that was my very first outing. After that I was never submitted. Um, so my ground game has always been, you know, top notch. But to take away the punching and the, and the MMA part of it almost would be like you take a piece of me away. So I've never really would, had the luck to just go in and cut one part of my heart out. Ken, when you were involved in the IFL, the International Fight League, your team, the Nevada Lions, really produced some some big players. Um, I'm talking about John Gons Gunderson and then, of course, uh, the heavyweight prospect, uh, big country Roy Nelson. And, your and opinion, don't forget Pat Healy. Don't forget well, about Pat Healy. That's right. Pat Healy was also a big player as well. Um, considering what you did in the IFL, what ha what went wrong with the IFL, and how could it have been changed? Well, um, I, I personally, my opinion, and it's just a one man's opinion, is I don't think it was ever built to succeed. I think it was built to make money, quick money, and get out. Uh, they as soon as they hit the stock market, uh, you know, they sold sold shares, uh, and they gave shares away to the fighters and competitors. Um, so they felt like they owned a part of the organization. They felt like they were going to be rich. Well, you couldn't sell them for a year or two years, however, however the stipulations were put on them. Uh, but then after about a year, um, after the first season, second season starts up, and the stocks are at its highest, and all of a sudden you start seeing the stocks go down. Well, um, from everything that I could tell, the owners, the people that were that had owned the, you know, the major, 
major major shares had sold their stock off and made millions and millions of dollars on an organization that I think was never built to succeed, was built to make quick quick money through the stock market. Now, Ken, uh, we all know that not only uh, have you fought in MMA, you were also in pro wrestling for a while. Just curious, what did you feel uh, was more of a challenge, being in the world of pro wrestling or the world of mixed martial arts? Oh, boy, that's apples and oranges. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's tough, because I tell you, um, I, there's a lot of great moments and a lot of great matches in, in both organizations. I, I couldn't really tell you, you know. I would have to, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I had really had a great, really great run in both, both sports and I really enjoyed both sports. So I couldn't really put a finger on which one it is that I would, would uh, love to do. I know even today, uh, I would still want to do both of them. Um, I couldn't tell you which one I would want to do first. That would lead into my next question. Who would you rather work for, Dana White or Vince McMahon? Which guy do you think oh. you'd get along with better? Vince McMahon, there's no question. Even though me and Vince uh, have our issues, and I don't even know what they are, I'd like to know. But for some reason, I've been trying to get back into the WWE, and uh, I've been, rumors been that they don't, uh, they're not interested, which doesn't make any sense to me, other than I made somebody mad or somebody doesn't like me and want me there, which could be, you know, Triple H, because I don't think we really, that I know of, I, I'm not sure, but rumor has it that, uh, you know, he might be one of the guys that doesn't want me back. I know Vince has his issues with me also, but nothing more than anybody else hasn't done there and has had an out, an out, had a chance to go back and, 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 and do something there, so... Um, even with that being said, I would much rather work with Vince than I would Dana because at least I know Dana would, at least I know for a fact that um, Vince would lie to me. He may not tell me something or he may set things up or, or work things out or however and not include me in a conversation. But I don't, in my, in my opinion, I don't think he would lie to me straight in the face like Dana White did to me several times. Ken, speaking of uh, wrestling and MMA, when I first saw your fights in Pancreas, I was absolutely blown away by by the hybrid wrestling concept. Um, there was also the what the UWF over in Japan. Did you ever consider switching over to the UWF as opposed to Pancrase, or uh, was Pancrase always really where you needed to be? No, Pancrase was um, where I wanted to be because uh, we we put that together, and I went with. Uh, um, Panaki and Suzuki, uh, when Pankwish started, uh, they wanted me to be their guy to come over and, and actually recruit for the U.S. And, and, and be their guy. But at the same time, I knew they were going to go to a hard style. And uh, so that's what I wanted. I wanted more competitiveness um, in these organizations. And so when they said that, that they were going to be a much more harder style, um, that sold me and I went with them. And uh, that's the reason why I was able to do um, so successfully in the UFC is because when I made that move, I was able to really improve my submission game and my striking, everything I needed to be to be a full MMA um, competitor. Ken, we talked about uh, James Tony and how you didn't think it was fair throwing him into the cage against against Randy Couture. Now, I, I don't know if I've told you this or not, but I'm a huge fan of Ken Shamrock. And uh, a couple years ago, you were getting ready to fight Kimbo Slice, and probably one of the most tragic injuries that could happen pre-fight happened. Um, if that fight had been greenlit and you could have fought Kimbo Slice, would you have uh, saw where the fight gone, or would you have tried to exploit Kimbo's vulnerability to the ground game? Well, I knew Kimbo was like a baby on his back. I already knew that. And so I couldn't understand how an organization could put so much on a guy who couldn't fight on the ground. Not, and not just not fight on the ground, but I mean, he couldn't stand up on his own. Uh, even if there was nobody there to keep him from standing up, he would have a hard time getting back to his feet. I couldn't understand that. And uh, so I knew he was really weak on the ground. So my thing was, is I was going to wear his ass, literally wear his ass out. I wasn't going to try and submit him. I wasn't going to do anything to him other than slap him, push his head in the mat, smash his face in the mat, Literally humiliate this guy and show him and show the organization. You cannot embarrass MMA by putting a guy in there who has no ability whatsoever 
He doesn't even. You, you can even. You couldn't even say the word submission. He doesn't belong in there representing MMA like that and making all that money when there's so many other people out there that should have been in his spot. And they were paying this guy a stupid amount of money, and he wasn't worth the powder to blow him up. Ken, uh, right after the fight, a lot of people came forward and said, oh, I would have jumped in, I would have jumped in. Seth Petrozelli eventually got, was awarded the fight, but uh, I believe one of the names that said he would have fought would have been would have been your brother Frank. Do you think that fight would have went Frank's direction? Oh, absolutely. Frank would have handled him like, you know, butter, hot, hot knife pulling through butter. I mean, uh, Frank is a, a decent stand-up guy. He's got good kicks. He moves well. Um, I think Kimball would have been chasing him around and getting tagged, and then eventually it would have went to the ground because Kimball can't stop anybody from taking him down. My brother is the worst shooter in the world, and he could have took Kimball down. And uh, once it got to the ground, game over. But just the conditioning in itself, uh, all Frank would have had to do was just leg kick him, jump around on him a little bit. Kimball would have got tired after two or three minutes, and then Frank would have had his way with him. Now, Ken, switching gears, you've been in movies and on TV. Um, if Hollywood was to do uh, the Ken Shamrock story, if they made a Ken Shamrock movie, what would you want the story to say, and who would you pick to play you? Uh, well, first of all, the story I would want is to show more of my struggles um, and the things that I had went through to get to where I was at today. Because it, it would it, the the one thing I want, want want kids to know that comes from where I come from, which is a group home background, basically no parents raising you, uh, in and out of juvenile hall, uh, in trouble with the law. Um, want them to know that because you go through these things, don't mean that you can't you don't have a shot at life. If you choose to put your nose to the grindstone. You choose to do something, and you focus on that something, and you don't let anything get in your way from getting it done. Um, then you can really do anything you want. It's uh, it, it's not really it's not it's 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 not an excuse to say I didn't have the opportunities that other people had because you may not have those opportunities just as I didn't. But when you get old enough, you can create those opportunities if you work hard enough and you get them done. And with that being said, I know it's not that easy because. Uh, people's minds get changed. People get into a, a pattern of doing things because of the way they were brought up. It's hard sometimes to break those patterns. So I know what I'm saying, and it doesn't always work like that because our minds are so easily manipulated and changed growing up certain ways. So um, I, it's not that easy, but at the same time, um, you also, too, have to know that it is, it is, there is a possibility and there is a way. Um, if you don't let them know that, then yeah, trying to manipulate and change their mind to something that they have no idea is even possible. Um, yeah, it would be tough. But if I could get that story out and get them to see that, hey, I was the worst that could be out there. Juvenile Hall at 10 years old. I went through group homes from the time I was 9 years old to the time I was 18 years old. Um, you know, in trouble with the law, strong arm robbery, staff. I did all those things, and yet I am here today because I have chosen not to be just another statistic. I chose to be somebody, and uh, it's possible. But you have to be able to – people have to be able to see these stories in order for them to be able to have this light go off in their head and say, I could do that. Ken, we got about three more questions for you. Um, you you're, you're one of the, the – bigger names than from the first UFC that are still competing. Whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't get to pick who I wanted to play me. Oh, go! Oh, I'm sorry, Ken. Go ahead. Yeah, don't be jumping on my question. The guy's got to answer. <laughs> That's right, man. Um, I think Mark Wahlberg. Excellent choice. Outstanding. Okay. <laughs> now my next question, Ken. Uh, being that you are one of the, uh, the living legends that are still competing today, when gloves were introduced to MMA, the uh, fingerless grappling gloves... How did you feel like your style was going to change in response to the surface of your hands changing, um, your striking ability? I didn't like it. Um, in fact, I didn't even like the rounds. Um, I, I like the idea, but again, I under, but I did understand why they changed, though. 
But um, I didn't like it because it does eliminate a lot of submissions. It gives people a a uh, a hold to grab onto to be able to stop your hands from moving. Um, yeah, I've several times going for leg locks. Guys just reach down and grab your gloves, and pretty much you're handcuffed. Um, so it did. It took. It did take away a lot of the submissions, even with rear naked chokes, trying to slide them in and out on the chin. Um, you know, working for for arm bars. Uh, it's just so easy to stop a guy's hand, trap a guy's hand um, with those gloves on, that it really eliminated a lot of quick submissions. Ken, have you ever been motivated to fight someone you've trained? And in that same vein, if you could fight any celebrity. Who would you fight? Well, I, I, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, uh, and I think it's been quite known for a long time that I wanted to fight my brother. Um, you know, just because of some of the disrespect that he showed towards my father, who saved his life. Um, so that that's always been out there, and I think that we're hopefully get to a point to where we could resolve some of those issues. Um, we'll see what happens. Um, but, you know, he's got a lot of answering to do. Uh, and hopefully he'll be able to do that because it sucks to go through life and, and not have explanations to why you would treat somebody so terribly that saved your life and gave you an opportunity at life. So hopefully those things will get resolved and we can move forward in life and, and hopefully, you know, do some things out there for the fans. Um, so we'll see what happens. You know, we're, we're, I know we're, we're meeting tonight to not me and Frank. Tomorrow me and Frank will meet. But uh, tonight we're going to be doing this, uh, ask me questions. And then tomorrow me and Frank get together and we're going to tell a story. And hopefully this story will come out and uh, things will be worked out. Talk about celebrating July 4th of fireworks, Ken. That is absolutely incredible. Yeah. Ken, Ken uh, Bob Lusabral recently retired. Rampage Jackson just signed a big deal for similar reasons that they didn't like working with Dana White. Have you considered approaching Bellator, or have you been approached by Bellator to uh, to really put use to what you are very, very good at? Yeah, I, 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 um, I, I have been approached, and um, I think this, uh, I think the story that we're doing is going to be Bellator is the one behind it. Um, so I don't know what the impact that's going to be, but I know the Ken Shamrock, Frank Shamrock, and Bob Shamrock story is going to be surf- surfaced around the Bellator. Parts of it. Ken, um, in closing, I, what's next for the world's most dangerous man? Where do you want to take your take your life and career going forward, and how would you want fans to support that? Well, first of all, um, I've got a reality show that's going to be we're actually sh- sh- uh, shooting a pilot on the 25th, 26th, 27th of July, um, and it's a I've got a bail bond and a security company in which where we bring um, you know, people into to train to become security or or bodyguards, um, whether it's international or whether it's just uh, babysitting rich people. Um, we're going to be doing a really reality series on that. Uh, we're, we're shooting a pilot uh, in July on the 24th, 25th, 26th, I believe. And, um, of course, then this story with Frank, um, I don't know when that's coming out, but I know that we're in the process of shooting that. And um, also, too, I've got my documentary coming out probably at the end of the summer, uh, which is going to be the trials and tribulations that I went through through my career talks about the troubles and the struggles that I've had and the successes that I've had and the reasons why I've had those successes. Um, and, that's, and that's already been shot in the can, so that should be coming out at the end of summer. So there's a lot happening with Ken Shamrock. Uh, we just wait for, um, you know, one, one of them to come out and the other two that we're getting ready to shoot. So within the next year, there's going to be a lot of exposure of, of who Ken Shamrock is, was, and will be. But I would have to say this, the one thing that I'm working for, that all this stuff that I'm doing uh, is geared towards, is that I was passed on from my father who adopted me when I was in a group home. I had no direction and no, no, nowhere, go, nowhere to go. I was, I was at the end of the road and one step, one foot in CYA and one foot out, which is California Youth Authority, which is a prison for kids. If I failed this home, I was going to prison. 
And uh, so I was at my last step. And he showed me ways to generate my anger and, 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 and my depressions and all the bad things that happened. He showed me how to direct that into something positive, and that was the sports. Where other kids had the similar problems, but they didn't do sports. They were singers or they were rappers or they were actors or, or musicians. But he was able to show these kids different ways to direct this hurt and this anger they had in life into something positive. Well, everything that I do from this point on, and this is where I want the fans support when the time comes, is that I'm build, I want to build a home. It's a, it's a million dollar plus home for a boys and girls. Two different homes um, to where I could take in children, troubled youth, who are at that last step, who don't have a direction in life, who are angry and frustrated because they keep failing over and over again. I want to show them a new way, a new way in life that they can they can take all those things that happen to them, all that frustration, anger, and direct it into something positive. And I'm going to show them how to do that. Ken, that is absolutely fantastic. Um, on behalf of the entire Cage Nation, we want to say thank you very much for for talking to us on the phone. I know this is a very, very big deal to me and, and Drew as well. It's um, a huge deal. Yeah, this is this is this is huge for us, Ken, and I appreciate the the time to to sit and talk to us. Um and, and happy fourth of July to you as well, Ken. Well thank you so much. And again I want to apologize to my fans, to Ian Freeman's fans, and to the fans in England and to the fans that were coming from the US to England. I apologize. Uh I'm sorry the fight didn't happen, but uh, it was something that was out of my control and that was completely in the organization's control to have this fight happen. They chose not to do the things they needed to do to make this fight happen. I know I'm going to take a lot of flack. I know they're going to talk a lot of trash about me and say it was my fault and that they did everything they needed to do to make this fight happen. But if you look at them and you look at me, which one wants to fight more? It's clearly the world's most dangerous man, and that's Obviously. that's the story I'll be telling everyone who crosses my path. God help them if they try to argue with me. Well, they, 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 it's about money, then, and for me, it's a business. Um, I'm not going to let somebody take advantage of me. I took this fight because I thought it was a great fight for me, and uh, at the last minute, I'm going to say, well, I don't want it no more. Yeah, that's been my reputation. Ken, best of luck to you. We're Unbelievable interview, my friend. <laughs> Uh, Ken Shamrock is again the living legend. He was a mixed martial artist before we even knew what to call a mixed martial artist. He was a mixed martial artist before we even knew what mixed martial arts was. Right. He he could clearly grapple. He could clearly strike. I mean, you know, the man the man hits like a truck. But then he also knew the submission game, which I don't think the Gracies were as prepared for because at UFC one, Hoist Gracie tore through everybody until he got to the world's most dangerous man. Then he found someone who was able to grapple with him. Now Ken is a warrior. If you go back and watch UFC 1, uh, Ken tapped out due to a gi choke. Uh, Royce Gracie had the gi wrapped around his neck. There was some confusion because referees didn't know what to do at the time, you know. Right. Uh, UFC 1 didn't have the benefit of a Chip Snyder or a Bill Bookwalter who, who knew what to look for. Ken was a warrior and said, no, I tapped out. Which, you know, he could have very well been like, oh, no, I'm going to continue to fight. But, you know, warriors don't do that. And that's, that's what Ken Shamrock's entire career was built on. Heat between him and his brother, sounds like. You know, um, it all stems back from from Bob Shamrock's, you know, raising these kids. Mm -hmm. He took Drew and, uh, not Drew, you're Drew. I'm Drew. He took Frank and Ken from, from terrible situations, you know, really terrible situations. You know, stuff you see Sally Struthers, you know, trying to get you to pay 79 cents a day for it. Right. And he gave them healthy outlets for, for emotions and aggression. And somewhere along the line, uh, Ken feels that Frank really just disrespected Bob. And I think at one point, uh, Frank even went by Frank Juarez Shamrock. As opposed to just Frank Shamrock. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. I mean, both these guys are legends. So I tell you what, Frank, how about we get you on the Cage Nation TV? Hey. We'd love to hear what you say. Um, th thank you again to Ken and everyone who helped us put that together. You know, this was a huge, huge momentous occasion for me. It is a, a momentous occasion for this guy as well as this guy right here. It's a pleasure talking to the world's most dangerous man, Ken Shamrock, and you heard it here on Cage Nation TV, and especially exclusive comments concerning oh, that yeah. fight that he was supposed to have. Well, I mean, you heard it. He apologized to not only his fans, which, you know, the, the Ken Shamrock Legion is, is massive in Canada. He apologized to the Cage Nation. He apologized to the Cage Nation, you guys. He also apologized to Ian Freeman's fans, which Ian Freeman has done, but Ian Freeman didn't apologize to Ken's fans. Right. So, you know, Ken really took the high road on that. Um, 
it's business though, you know, like promoters are promoters, and it's kind of troubling to get all that stuff organized from across the pond. All right, I say. All right, it's time now for the camera perspective with Mr. Albert Cameron. I'm going to leave the set now. Today was probably one of the biggest days of me being involved in mixed martial arts. Before that, it was me talking to Dan the Beast Severin. I want to take you back and talk to you about Albert Cameron when he was about 15 years old in 1998. Albert Cameron had this favorite t-shirt of his, and it was a Ken Shamrock t-shirt that he got when Ken Shamrock was involved in the WWF. Albert Cameron used to get a lot of flack for wearing that t-shirt. Albert Cameron, um, I, I'll stop talking to myself in the third person because that's just kind of weird. Who are you, The Rock? <laughs> I used to get a lot of flack for wearing that t-shirt because I was so passionate about, you know, what I was in, the fandoms I had. If... When we go through that age, 15, 13, 14, 15, we're all at a de very delicate mental state. We don't know, you know what our purpose in life is. We don't know where we belong, and that is troubling enough. But then once you take on something so passionately and you have to try to explain yourself and defend what you're into to other people, that just that makes things more difficult. If Albert Cameron at 28 years old could go back to talk to Albert Cameron at 15 years old, I would sit down and I would tell him, listen kid, life's hard now, but you need to stick to your convictions. The things you believe, the things you're passionate about now are going to take you places. Me being as humble as I am, I can tell you that I have had a lot of opportunities open up to me that I wouldn't have earned without some very important help. A lot of the guys who take me along the way was Mr. Drew Shannon himself. But me, I, I stuck to my convictions. I never said, hey, I don't like MMA or hey, I don't like this. And I was always true to myself. So the Cameron perspective today is, as old as you are, as young as you are, always stick to your passions. Stick to what you believe in, because eventually those convictions are going to bring you to the dance, ladies and gentlemen, and that is the Cameron perspective. And I will say this. Uh, years ago, there was a young man, Albert Cameron, uh, who walked into a radio station, and uh, just happened to be the station I worked for, and uh, was an intern. He was my intern uh, for at least, what, a, a semester? Yeah. He was an intern for a semester. And he was very willing, very eager to learn, and he did. He learned rather well. So well that he got himself an interview with the world's most dangerous man, Ken Shamrock. He wrote out almost every single question that you heard us ask. I improvised like maybe one or two, but everything we asked, he sat there and wrote them all out. I'm proud of you. Thank you. I'm going to say this as, as not only your friend, your co-host, but as your mentor. I'm very proud of you for that interview. You did a great job, and just keep lining them up. You got it. Not just for you, not just for me, but for them, the Cage Nation. Next week, we'll be back. Maybe not have an interview with the magnitude of a, of a Kemp Chermock, but we'll be talking more about uh, MMA. In fact, let me see what the script says here. Um, oh, it says to tune in next week. Follow us on Facebook. He wrote this, too. <laughs> Follow us on Facebook, like us on Twitter, and join the community at the CNTV message boards at CageNationTV.com. Is there anything else that... Oh, stay tuned for upcoming coverage, Valley Fight League, and Gladiators of the Cage. Okay, and you spelled it all correctly. Good man. <laughs> uh, Cage Nation, i got to tell you, you know, for this being like the biggest day in my sports career, I'm glad I got to share it with you guys. Thank you for watching. We'll see you guys again next week. For Albert, I'm Albert Cameron. This is True Shannon. You guys have been watching Cage Nation TV. You were supposed to edit all that up. Oh. See you next week. <laughs> Let's go.